Ladies and gentlemen, we are back with another episode of What's On Your Mind. I'm Chris Quill, and it's our privilege this week to have Edward Sheck and Ben Burgreen uh, joining me on the show. And these guys are going to be talking about their views on the financial markets currently and also some ideas that they've been thinking about for their own portfolios. Uh, Ed, Ben, fantastic to have you guys on. And I think we'll get straight into things with you, Ed, today. What have you been thinking about over the last few weeks? Well, hello, everyone. Hi, Chris. Hi, Ben. Well, like uh, most people are in the markets, it's all been a build up to today. It's CPI day. How exciting. Now, the previous CPI obviously led a big chain of events. So the month on month was accelerating. It was 0.2 of a percent worse than expected. We couldn't call peak inflation for, for the value in that. And what happened? The bond market sold off 60 basis points in two days, and we had a massive risk off, uh, a risk off sell. Makes sense. So now we've had the CPI. It's dropped a couple of hours ago. And now we've got the nine handle, and now all the press can talk about highest inflation for 41 years, I've been led to believe, and this narrative can spin. The month on month has accelerated on to 1.3%. But when you look at the price action, bond market's pretty relaxed. Two years gone up six basis points to 310, inversion steepening. So the 10 years not really done much. It's inverted by 15 basis points, 310, 295. Obviously, the market opens low, big panicky inflation miss, they sell tech. And now everything's quite stable, tech's outperforming. The reason why I'm going to go into this in a bit more detail is that it does lead into my long idea, which is in application software. So why, if inflation appears to be getting worse, and I, am I starting to think about the next potential shift, potential? Why am I adding a bit of long tech bias now in anticipation of a potential rotation out of some of the crowded long areas into the massively under owned tech space. But I'll come on to my idea later. So it's really important to try and tune out all the stories, because some of them get stale, the same old narratives, and look at the data. So why I think the bond market's very sanguine is when you break down the CPI, and when you think about the previous CPI, the big problems were rents, food, and energy. When we look at gasoline in the print that's come out today on the 13th of July, gasoline was up 11%. But when we actually look at the real data currently over the last few weeks, we know that gasoline demand is now 9% lower year on year. Three months ago, it was up 10% year on year. That makes sense. We've come out of winter. Thankfully, most of us haven't died from COVID. We start moving around. People go out and play. Demand goes up. Now we've got gasoline at $5. Demand destruction happens. This is what the Fed wants. Now people are driving less. Gasoline is now from 5 to 460 So it's fallen 10%. So in the next CPI report, if it stays where it is, something that's been an up 11% this month falls 10%. Now we're not talking about prices actually falling. We just need them to not go up anymore that at least will give us our final, our first month-on-month -month improvement. So when I look at the facts of gasoline, I think the next print, it's going to be supportive for the bond market being a bit more relaxed about where terminal rates are. Let's have a look at food. This month, up 1%. Go and have a look at what soft commodities have done over the last three to four weeks, right? What have we got? I should actually go to my notes here. I can't remember the exact numbers. Soybeans down 9%, wheat down 25%, uh, palm oil down 40%, rapeseed, sunflower oil down 20 These are all the Ukraine-Russia situation spikes, big exporters, Ukraine. Cheese and milk down 9 canola down 23 rice down 5 I could continue. Now, I'm not saying if I was manufacturing food with Ben, unless we were completely altruistic, when we next buy for the next quarter's production, our inputs are down a lot. Now, we can try and put prices up and talk about energy and staff costs, but our margins are going up. So maybe food stops going up. We're still more profitable. But when your inputs are falling quite fast, 
surely next month we'll see an improvement month on month on food. Rents, this is a bit more tricky, although there's so much evidence of housing market really weakening. But rents are long to adjust, long time. So what's happening in the housing market? Well, new ho uh, existing home listings are up 20%. That's everyone trying to get lucky. Maybe let's sell out, retire, move, or you just float your house out trying to top tick the market because you know where mortgage rates have gone. What's the stages of a housing market correction? Lower activity, bit more supply. When we've got an affordability gap. So where sellers are up here, the buyers are here, activity falls. Eventually it will trade, obviously for life reasons, people do have to move. So my view on the data that I see is I would expect house prices to fall, but the delivery from house prices to rents going down is longer duration. Why are a third of US home builders cutting their prices by 15%? I thought three months ago they were saying, if we had another half a million homes, we'd sell them tomorrow. Well, that's not true. When we think about Walmart and Target four months ago, have we got enough stuff to sell? Now we're offloading bulk to Ross stores. So in this extraordinary macro setup, what I'm reminding myself is the unraveling from not enough to too much seems to be happening extremely quickly as everyone's really guessing what the terminal rate will be. So inventories, inventory build we all know about, price is down. Now, interestingly, Apparel is still up on this month. So that is a disappointment from an inflationary point of view. But we also know that the real wage, uh, sorry, your available uh, spend as a consumer is going down. Ero inflation's obviously eroding your real purchasing power. So again, I wouldn't surprise me if that starts to ease. Used cars still going up, but slowing. Financing getting more expensive. That looks like it's topping out. So the problem with the rents is if there's an affordability gap, it is possible that some people will stay in rented for longer and rents are still going up. So I'm not calling the top and I'm not saying it's going to come back down fast. What I am saying is I think I'm asking myself the question, how quickly can things change? And yet again, last Friday's jobs report, really strong. And yet every day I'm just seeing companies laying off people, laying off people. And I'm asking myself, is the labor market really as good as all the stories around? And I'm not looking at the stories. I'm just trying to look at facts and then forecast what I think that means. That's really all I want to cover on the macro side. The other thing I will mention briefly is this extreme positioning. So obviously, for this year, as inflation's picked up and the Russia-Ukraine situation's in play, people have been hiding in oil, materials, staples, healthcare, utilities, less so in industrials, less so in financials. And they've been right to be underweight. Tech, consumer, discretionary, and of course, communication services. So I'm checking whether or not this tale is about to change. So I'm not saying, yeah, let's short all of the outperformers and buy all of tech, but I am saying, or am I, what I'm doing is starting to add a bit of tech bias. The bond market is supportive. Today's price action, for what it's worth in a day, is starting to be supportive. But the basis of this is just trying to not look at the stories and look at the data. And the bond market is looking through. The White House said, this is going to be bad but you've got to look through it. Not that they're a harbinger of the truth looking forward on economics, but the market's clearly seen that. So now the expectation when you tune out the headlines is maybe the CPI is going to start to become more favourable. Ben. All right. It's a good, uh, good little intro there, Ed. I'll add a couple of things. Talking, you're talking about the housing market. Um, you know, one thing we look at for as a leading indicator for the housing market is also lumber prices. Because lumber is obviously one of the biggest um, really materials used for housing, and and they've been cutting they've been cut in half. You know, in the past six months, lumber prices went from like twelve hundred to six hundred, and they're just hovering around six hundred. And also, the big kind of. Uh, I guess elephant in the room has been crude oil, but you know what? 
crude oil topped mid June, and it's you know been falling since. Even today, it's lower, and been staying below a hundred bucks for the past like a week and a half. So uh, this you know this whole like panic about inflation, yeah, it's you might have said this before, but uh, with uh, core inflation actually been weakening over the past several months, also there's a pretty good chance that uh, we kind of seen, you know, the worst of this. So anyway, the um, idea that I'm going to talk about has really nothing to do with inflation, Ukraine, or any of that. You know, in a market like this, it's uh, it might we might have some trade ideas based on the you know the economical environment. But it's also good to throw in some that are independent from all this stuff, just in case we are wrong on the timing of this whole thing. So I'm going to talk about a company that I am pretty excited about that I found, maybe even heard about it before. <clears throat> I found it using one of our quantitative screens, and it's uh, a long idea of uh, C3.ai. Right? So the ticker is AI. And uh, this is a $2 billion market cap company. They went public in uh, December of 2020 at 42 bucks, where they sold almost 50 million shares and raised about a little over $650 million in new funding. So they are an enterprise artificial intelligence software company operating in uh, basically all over the world, uh, the US, Europe, Middle East, Africa, and uh, in, in Asia. So the you know one thing I always like to see in small companies is the what's going on with the founder like who founded it are they still running it and what's their background so this company was founded in uh, 09 by a guy named Tom Siebel All right so Tom Siebel worked at Oracle actually in the 80s so way back in the day when Oracle was a tiny little company with 20 employees uh, and he was one of the kind of the head honchos there. Uh, he did a few, uh, moved a few uh, around a little bit, a few other companies, and he started his own company called Siebel Systems that he sold to Oracle for uh, almost $6 billion, okay, 15 years ago. So this guy knows what he's doing, right? And he has, also has deep pockets, which helps. And, in, and actually, before, right when I merged with Oracle, his company, this is back in 1999, his company became the fastest growing tech company in the US. And they grew to over 8,000 employees in 32 countries. And they had more than 4,500 corporate customers and their annual revenues were greater than 2 billion. So this is a serious guy, all right? He's not messing around. Um, and he literally wrote a book on digital transformation or books in his case. So it's a very impressive, impressive guy, individual. Um, and uh, but you know, it's also not a, not enough to just have um, a, a, you know a, a good leader at the helm. You also have to see what's going on under the hood, see what this company is all about. So let's just move on to the actual company here. And I had to do a little digging because I didn't really know much about this myself. Um, and that's what's pretty interesting about trying to find trade ideas. You uh, learn a lot about things you might not know about earlier, <clears throat> which is definitely the case here. Um, and it's a bit daunting, okay? Because the whole AI thing, it's gonna be a bit uh, confusing, especially for older guys like uh, Ed and myself. <laughs> so they provide um, a comprehensive suite of software services, okay? For companies to be able to run all parts of their AI machine learning. Uh, and it's really the whole direction of all things. Okay, I don't care what industry you're in, this is the direction where things are going, digital transformation. And it's really an integrated suite of software services uh, using what they call model-driven architecture. And uh, kind of to make a long story short, it provides all the software services necessary uh, for a company to uh, operate on enterprise scale AI app, okay, across really all facets of organization. And I have a, a kind of a schematic on here that uh, tries to emphasize this point a little bit, and I'll get, you know, I'll get a little deeper into it, but, uh, you know, one step at a time here. So the design software that they, uh, that they focus on 
is really applicable to most industrial and commercial scale uh, industries. Okay, so this is a this is a company that has a very wide reach. Like you're looking at manufacturing, oil, gas, utilities, banking, military, defense, healthcare, retail, uh, governments, transportation, pretty much everything. And they actually have the largest enterprise AI production footprint in the world with close to 5 million machine learning models in production. Uh, so that's, you know, for a small company that most of us probably never heard about is, uh, is kind of a big deal. So this is a little glimpse, okay, of what these guys do. But if I'm going to dig deeper into their actual setup, how this all works, it's going to take all day, uh, which we don't have. So let's just truck on. Right, so the stock itself is uh, trading around twenty bucks. Okay, it was up at one eighty back in uh, right when they after they launched the RPO, uh, and uh, this was in uh, in twenty twenty in December. And when the stock was at one eighty, the revenue stood at one hundred sixty five million. So now the stock is at 20 bucks and revenue is at 253 million. That's on a 12 month trailing basis. And also revenue uh, growth has been accelerating. And I have a chart on here, a weekly chart of the stock with uh, trailing revenue laid on top. I like to display things this way. <clears throat> it's just easier to kind of put it in perspective. So why is the stock being crushed? A uh, big problem has been uh, the profitability has been negative and has been getting worse. And the reason for that is because these guys have just dumped pretty much, you know, a lot of the money that they make in revenue into R&D. There's a huge R&D expenditure, which you can imagine for a company like this, uh, just kind of going all in in AI. So they actually spend 44% uh, of revenue um, on R on R&D, but they have a billion dollars of cash in the bank. Um, and with growing economies of scale, the costs should definitely come in line. And uh, when, it, when it does, uh, profitability and earnings should go positive. So if you look at the forward-looking consensus estimates here, um, the analyst community is uh, forecasting it to go positive in 2025 with um, a couple of catalysts I'm going to talk about in a sec. I think this can happen sooner. Uh, but anyway, revenue growth is also expected to accelerate, okay, from 23% um, in 2023 to 27% the next year and 33% in 2025. And then, uh, you know, they have cash and balance sheet, stable long term liabilities uh, to assets of 12 to 15%. The company is in pretty good shape financially, even though their earnings have been uh, crushed. But, you know, this is what happens a lot with new young companies, especially in uh, that have a uh, kind of high expenditure when it comes to R and D. That they uh, the earnings kind of bomb for a while, and then uh, you know it, it creates some good opportunities, and then it turns out to be hugely profitable down the line. So, but all of this, all of this is great, right? But uh, it's not enough still, right? For, to to deem it a great trade idea, we also need a catalyst. So what's the specific catalyst uh, why this stock might start rallying from where it is now? Well, just recently, they got some new contracts, right? So Raytheon Technologies, ticker RTX, actually selected this company, uh, this company's application platform to deliver AI and machine learning capabilities for the US Army's uh, tactical intelligence targeting access node program called named Titan. And they were also awarded a joint $90 million contract from the US Department of Health and Human Services in uh, just in June, just last month. So specifically what that does, okay, for the Health and Human Services Department, it enables them to uh, basically procure the C3 AI applications across all their uh, platforms and uh, incorporate machine learning and predictive AI capabilities. So, you know, and that's just, these are just a few companies. This is kind of where everything is set in and this company is on the forefront of that technology. And it could be a lot of contracts coming down the line that could boost the bottom line. 
so this is all you know all 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 good and um but it's but it's still not enough to cause it to be a trader in itself you still want to look at the structure the what's actually going on with the price you know with the price action of the stock so in this case the, the stock came off went all the way down to like 15 bucks all right it's not rebounded it's actually up today even though the market was down quite a bit earlier and um, it's important to look at this as kind of a final arbiter of a trade idea because at the end of the day, the only way we make money as traders is if we get the stock price right. You know, we can be, we can have the best companies in the world that we talk about, but unless we get the stock move right, we're still not going to make money. So we use this kind of as a <clears throat> price action and technicals as a you know, supporting tool in the whole process. So we're looking at a daily chart here. And uh, stock has bottom, bottom around 15, and we're now seeing uh, segments of higher, uh, higher lows. And then we have this kind of 2150 level being challenged in the very near term. And there's this huge air pocket, okay, between 25 and 45. Uh, and another thing is here, there's 18% short interest in this stock. So as soon as this stock starts kind of popping over these levels of 2150, it's probably going to be massive short covering. And for this reason, when I find trade ideas like this, that looks like they're turning around with a big short interest, I like to just go long calls because you can get very aggressive moves, right? Um, so I'm just looking at long calls over the next earning cycle. So we're looking at the options chain as of July 11th. So this is on Monday. And uh, the company is expected to report earnings end of August. And after that, the next expiry month is October. So in this case, going along the October 20 strike at 250, you could really position this nicely for uh, unlimited profit potential if the shares get juiced, especially uh, after the over the earnings release, if they get new contracts and whatnot. And, um, you know, sky's the limit on a play like this. But if the stock gets to 40, let's say, by the October expiry, which, yeah, that's a double. Um, but in these small volatile stocks, that could happen. Uh, well, in that case, this, uh, the options will be worth, you know, the, the $20 difference in the strikes minus 250 to $1,750 or $1,750 uh, $1, profit <clears throat> for a $250 cost per contract. So uh, the reward risk is, is very high. Uh, and also, you know, with this guy who's running at Siebel, there's a good chance this could be a takeover target, which can definitely boost the shares a lot higher. So even a further out ex uh, expiry might make sense here. So um, that kind of wraps up this long idea. So I'll kick it back to you, Ed. Thank you, Ben. So as I said, I've, I've picked a stock called Ring Central, but I want to talk quickly about the screen. So I want to add this start to get overweight tech, but I'm going to scale in for obvious risks in the market. But it's important when you're adding bias to know what your triggers are for getting more aggressive. We always want to have lots of risk and have an aggressive, high conviction view. In this sort of market, when worrying about terminal rates, we don't need to go all in and be ahead of the entire curve. You want, or I want a position, I want to add, but add when I see supportive data and flows of funds. So my screen, I decided that I wanted to look at profitable application software. I don't want hardware. I don't want semis, not digital advertising, social media. I wanted pure tech, but I wanted something that was growing sensibly. I wanted something that was profitable. So ideally, when you think that earnings growth for the S&P could be 5 or 9%, whatever, 5 or 10% this year, and it's trading on 16 times. That's always your in the back of your mind sort of framework. So what I really want is something that's growing revenues 20% this year, 20% next year, and I want earnings to be at least flat, okay? So it's not going to be a massive exploding growth opportunity, but I'm looking for slow and steady with a big addressable market to drive. And of course, the valuation plays a bigger part with the macro. So Ring Central, $5 billion market cap, IT application software. 
global enterprise cloud communications, video meetings, collaboration, contact center services and software, right? So if you're a client, you've got your staff all over the place over multiple devices, you use a company like Ring and there are lots of them and that's a problem, but we'll talk about that. And, you know, Zoom being the obvious competitor, we're all using a version of this. And so the question is, well, inflation's going up, isn't this an ex-COVID, you know, ex-COVID winner, ex-growth going to nothing? Maybe, maybe not. They basically have three products, uh, Ring Central MVP. So this is unified communications as a service. Ring Central customer engagement. This is cloud contact center as a service and the Ring Center video. All right. They have very flexible pricing. They're at the low end of the range. Stress-free webinars with all the bells and whistles, integrations, analytics, customization, AI enabled. So you miss a meeting, you've got recording capability, it'll provide you with cliff notes, you can skim read them, know what the salient points were. Enough about the product, we know what the product is. Now, the other interesting thing is that it is open uh, platform. And so what that means is it has countless application integrations and partnerships, some with its competitors, some with uh, more collaborative uh, clients. For example, they, they're teamed up with Microsoft Teams. And you'll say, well, why on, earth, why on earth does Microsoft Teams want to use Ring Central? Well, there are parts of Ring Central that are better or fill a gap of Microsoft Teams. So these open platform collaborations include companies like Microsoft Teams and Zendesk for business digitalization collaboration, Salesforce and Oracle in the CRM segment, Gmail and Google Drive in the productivity segment, Dropbox in storage, New Relic in analytics, so on and so forth. So it's a busy space, right? Let's go to the quants. This company, over the last two years, eight reporting seasons, has beaten and guided up in revenues and earnings. So this is the company that is delivering. Revenue growth this year, 25%. Next year, 25%. Earnings growth this year, 38 30% next year. You know I like operating leverage on my longs. I want earnings to be going up faster than revenue. It means margins are improving, okay? We hear about peak margins. We hear about this all the time. We've talked about it. It's been right. It's playing out. Now, of course, we're entering earnings season when hopefully the macro will take a back foot and we can actually look at company fundamentals. PE of this stock, 30 this year, falling to 23. So when I tie it back to that, what's the S&P valuation? We're not trading the S&P, but I'm looking at much superior revenue growth, much superior earnings growth by a factor of five or six, multiple up 40%. So is this acceptable growth? Now, for me, this was a good quant. This is exactly the sort of stock I'm looking for for now. Obviously, if this trend continues and this flow of funds does happen and bond market stays where it is or if it moves up, moves up slowly, then I'll get more aggressive up the risk curve. When we look at last earnings and quants and KPIs, subscription growth up 35, operating margin up 10% to 10.4, free cash flow margin up 20% to 8%. So it's making money, it's throwing off more and more cash, which isn't bad in this environment. It has this rule of 40, which I don't massively like. It's just when you take your subscription growth, add your operating margin, and it's above 40. So this is really the company flagging that subscription growth may slow, and it's come from 35% to 25%. This is to be expected, but as long as your earnings, the scale, the leverage is coming through, any slowdown in subscription growth, as long as it's accompanied by more and more profitability, should support the valuation. Now, average revenue per user hasn't moved in five quarters, $32 per seat. Gross margin hasn't moved over five quarters, 82%. It's high, but it's application software. So surely, Ed, this means there's no pricing power. Yeah, right. You're correct. It's super competitive, could be commoditized. So why on earth do you want to buy it? 
Well, the total addressable market is still massive, okay? Two, 300 million seats, according to Barclays research, of which 75 million are, have digitalized, gone to the cloud for all the benefits that companies need for efficiency and cost-based management. So we're not through it. I know we've been talking about cloud for years. You think, God, it must have happened. It hasn't. So as long as they maintain their market share, if they can grow it, especially with their strategic partners, there is a lot of upside to earnings. Let's think about strategic partners, right? The latest two they've had is Avaya and Mittel. Mittel's a communications company, not the steel company. Avaya is not a direct competitor, but it's a cloud digitalization company. It has 100,000 seats. It signs up with Ring. Ring brings something they don't have. Why it's good for earnings leverage is now Ring has a captive 100,000 seats. This tends to be sticky. Everyone takes up the profit. Your cost of acquisition per seat is lower. You get leverage. And that's really it. So what we need this company or I need this company to do is to continue to drive strategic relationships, good collaborations, and keep its market share in a market that's still got huge untapped potential. Now, pricing pressure could be a problem, right? Growth could start to slow down. None of these things are good for growth software. But going back to what Ben said about where C, uh, AI had come from and come down to, Ring was at 440 when valuations were absurd. Now it's at 50. What we are not saying is it's down 90%, it can't go lower. That is absolutely not what we're saying. What we are saying is under certain macro conditions, if there are positive catalysts that can get operational leverage going and a big short base, the risk to the upside can be quite fast and quite rapid. If you think this is like DocuSign or Teladoc, X growth, margins compressing, no sign of growth, you don't want to buy it, okay? The reason why I've outlined this is there's a big macro component. I'm looking for a very specific type of stock, slow and steady, something that's performing, something that historically has performed to the upside. So this company has been growing its revenue and earnings by 30% every quarter, all the way down from 440. Clearly, the valuation now is what I'm starting to enter, some sensibly priced tech in a slowing economy with an inverting yield curve, is in a very simplistic way, the more the economy slows down, right, the more a company that's growing its revenue and earnings by 30% is going to look relatively attractive. Where do you go? When does tech become defensive? That's really the question that I'm asking. So obviously, there are a lot of risks. If they've beaten for eight quarters on the trot and they start missing, that's going to be bad. Inflation shocks the yield curve shifting up. Now, clearly, the higher short-term rates go, the more steep the yield curve will get, I should imagine, because higher short-term rates increase the likelihood of a harder and harder landing. But clearly, that's a risk. Strong dollar, not helpful for any company with overseas earnings, lots of competition. And of course, if the economy really slows down, will enterprise investment stop? Well, those companies say, we're not going to spend this to move our business forward. And that, of course, is a, is a risk. So in summary, solid software performer, still a path to a big addressable market, operational leverage now and expanding momentums there. Valuation is as sensible as it has been since COVID started. Structure, right, stocks of 50, price target 70, 65, we'll call it. Earnings beginning of August, too, too late to try and trade the expiry, the July the 15th option. You can set this up as a two for one. You can buy the August 5th is for about six bucks. You can sell the July 29th to give yourself two weeks, give yourself a 56 handle, try and collect that credit, you'll get $1.30. So you're trying to pick up a $650 credit on a five grand net spend, be long for August earnings, stock rallies into it, or after it, then set up the vertical, the August 65. 
you'll raise the two and a half dollar credit. If it goes to 65, you'll make 12 grand. Your initial net spend is five grand. If you can sell the August vertical, you get your net spend down to two and a half, but your maximum loss, if it goes straight down, will be five grand. If you're feeling more punchy, you just buy an out of the money August vertical. Buy the August 55s, sell the August 65s, you get in for about two and a half dollars. Maximum you can make is 10. It's a three for one. Not bad with a high bold tech stock. The ring central. Brilliant. Thanks for that, Ed. Um, very well explained, especially how you're coming down from the macro idea to uh, application software and obviously Ring Central. So, yeah, good stuff. Um, there's two longs we've talked about today. Um, ben, let's go back to you. Did you have anything on the short side you wanted to look at? Yeah, here we are. Um, yeah, Ed, super in depth. Uh, I, I like the way you, you know, I like the way you think. <laughs> My idea coming up is uh, definitely not as in-depth. It's a lot simpler. Uh, a good trade idea doesn't have to be complicated or complex. Um, you know, some are, some are not. This idea is fairly simple, and it kind of ties into the macro that Ed talked about in the beginning about <clears throat> potentially slowdown, uh, slowdown in the economy, topping inflation, uh, especially in the energy space. Okay, so... This is something that we talked about before. Uh, these things just kind of take time to play out. But uh, I'm looking at a short in uh, Chen Year Energy. Okay, the ticker is LNG. And uh, it's a $32 billion uh, market cap company. They are primarily engaged in liquefied natural uh, gas market. So this is a stock idea that is tied um, to the price of net gas, really. And I have a chart on that gas up, um, you know, up on the board here. And um, that gas, as well as other energy, um, you know, assets got boosted by the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Um, the nat gas plays a little different <clears throat> because Russia supplies 40% of Europe's natural gas via pipeline. Um, you know, and that's not really the case with, with crude. So, but anyway... This display does tie a bit into that um, scenario, you know, in, going on in Ukraine. Um, we have a situation where <clears throat> the EU sought to impose a bunch of bans on Russian crude and natural gas to uh, cripple Putin's war machine, which makes total sense, you know, in theory. But the problem is that with 40% of natural gas coming from Russia uh, to other countries, countries in Europe, they, it's just not practical for a lot of countries like Hungary and other countries that, you know, they need, especially, you know, as we turn around and coming into winter, they need natural gas. And it's not like they're getting it from other countries to fill that gap. So it's just not really um, practical to, to presume that all of a sudden Russia is just not going to export any more natural gas to Europe. Uh, but anyway, you know, as the war was starting to kind of emerge, nat gas had a massive move. You can see that on this chart uh, where nat gas futures actually doubled March through May. And uh, similar to crude oil, interestingly enough, topped in June. Uh, we also know that wars come and go and wars don't last forever. These, you know, what's going on over there is just not sustainable. And one way or another, it's going to get sorted out at some point. And Usually, it gets sorted out by some sort of diplomatic uh, compromise. We'll see how it goes. But in the meantime, nat gas has had a you know massive pullback as uh, expectations are that this is going to come to an end uh, sooner or later, and um, and it's been just mean reverting this this uh, you know this drastic move. And you know the world keeps turning. Uh, people are buying stuff. People need to get warm. People you know buy oil, nat gas, whatever. Like it's a, you know, it's a, it's a world where we are pretty good at adapting to uh, adverse situations and things just move on, right? So we also saw what happened really also in that gas. There was an explosion in uh, June, okay, at the Freeport uh, LNG export plant here in the United States. That's really what started the natural gas sell-off. So why, why would that start a natural gas sell-off? Well, it's because Freeport is the second biggest U.S. 
liquid natural gas exporting plants uh, was consuming about 2 billion cubic feet per day of gas, okay, before it shut down. So it's as closed, it's expected to be closed for 90 days. And being closed for 90 days, that will leave around 180 billion cubic feet of gas available to the U.S. market. So this, is, this will cause and has caused actually an oversupply of net gas in the U.S. So this is really more of a, <clears throat> the situation surrounding the net gas inventories in the U.S. And as this table shows, we've seen a pretty hefty uh, buildup really in inventories over this time. All right, so the stock which I have on here now is the weekly chart of LNG. Um, I also have the EPS, okay, earnings per share on top of the chart. And on the bottom, there's a pink line, and that is uh, total cost of revenue. And I'm going to kind of walk you through how this all ties together. So the stock rallied about 400%, okay, from 30 to 180 during that time, earnings turned negative and has been accelerating to the downside. Um, and really the reason for this is, you can see that at the bottom of um, the magenta line here is because the cost of revenue climbed from 6 billion to 20 billion during that same period. So here, that begs the question, you know, if they can't be profitable during this time of increased revenue growth and a very strong pricing environment, what is it going to take for these guys to actually make money? What's going to happen if natural gas comes, I'm not going to say crash, but, you know, mean reverse further and comes back kind of to uh, more reasonable levels. If they can't make money in a prime environment, it's going to be really hard for them to make money when things are not just going their way. So that's one thing. All right. So another thing I like to look at uh, specific catalysts with these stock plays. Okay. Same as with the AI, there has to be something going on that uh, is going to kick the stock into gear. In this case, you know, in this case, lower, obviously. Um, but we're talking about the EPA, okay, the Environmental Protection Agency here in the US. I love the environment, and I'm all for protecting it. I'm always out there fishing and doing stuff in nature all the time. Uh, living in California, you know, we are pretty like pro environment and all that. So, but Okay, there's a time and a place. And to implement stricter environmental rules at this point in time with everything that's going on from uh, the Biden administration is just a really, really bad time to do this. It could not come at a worse time. So what happened is in February, the EPA announced that starting this August, which is next month, they are making the rules stricter towards uh, applying to uh, some gas turbines. So gas fire turbines that were previously left out of the regulation. And around 250 US gas turbines will be subject to that rule. Um, but according to the EPA list regarding this, Shenier Energy is the only LNG company that used these turbines, okay? And whose facilities would be affected. And according to Reuters, uh, the company, which accounts for about half of all LNG shipments from the U.S., has told the EPA that its export plants in Louisiana and Texas use unique uh, turbine designs that can just not be converted easily, you know, to, to meet the pollution controls. Um, so they, so what they have done is they asked for, it has to be exempt from the emission limits. And as you can imagine, <clears throat> dealing with this stuff is there's a ton of red tape, delays, drags on. Well, we're now mid-July, okay? And there's a very good chance it's going to drag out beyond August. And um, that's going to cause some serious headwind and problems with this company if they're going to have to start converting these turbines. And even if, the, even if that doesn't come to pass, you know, just the fact that there's this uncertainty as that might happen could really put pressure on the stock. Um, so anyway, the stock itself kind of bounced around um, throughout April, mostly uh, up until recently when it started breaking lower. Okay, so it was hovering between 130 and 145 for a while. And it just recently started breaking lower. We're now seeing lower highs, lower lows, um, and based on the trajectory of the 
of the stock price and uh, where the last support level is, there's a pretty good chance this stock can get to between 100 and 105 over the next two to four months. You know, that's where we're seeing strong support <clears throat> from this basing area that happened last quarter of uh, the last quarter of 2021. So to wrap this up, the company report earnings in uh, three to four weeks or so. So I'm looking at this as a near term play. Um, that's also due to the fact that when stocks fall, they tend to fall kind of hard and fast. So it's like, you know, stocks in general, uh, in an uptrend, it's like climbing Mount Everest and then they fall down the other side, fall off the cliff on the backside. That's how it goes. So when stocks fall, they can fall hard and fast, right? So, and with this uh, EPA verdict coming on um, and potential weakness in that gas, um, we can we can expect this stock to potentially have a, you know, it could be a pretty aggressive sell-off. We'll see. <clears throat> but in the meantime, though, they are uh, with uncertainties and everything and, uh, and potential downside, we can look at how to structure this, right? So because of the near term view, I look at this as a vertical put spread. And um, the August 120, 100 spread, buying the August 120, uh, selling the 100 uh, puts, these are both puts for a net cost of 457. This was as of a few days ago, gives you a reward of potential of $1,540 per contract. Okay. And um, and a cost of 450 or some bucks. So it's a three for one reward risk in about a month's time. So this is one of those trades that uh, it's a rapid trade, uh, high reward risk and um, you know pretty solid potential for uh, success. So we'll see how, see how that one plays out. So that's the wrap on this one. Great stuff. Um, well, I think we'll, we'll wrap things up with the episode as well. It's been another fantastic discussion from you guys today. I'm sure all our uh, watchers and listeners really appreciated that as I did, of course. Uh, now for all of you watching and listening, if you did enjoy that episode, you'll of course enjoy our other content that we have available. And you can enjoy that through our website, itpm.com. We've got courses up there. We've got mentoring programs. We've got uh, webinars and seminars, something for everyone. So do take a look and see if you can come along to any of the webinars or seminars or other events, see if you can go on a course or whatever you think suits you and it will definitely help your own trading portfolio going forward. But uh, yeah, that's it for today. As I said, I hope you guys all enjoyed the episode and make sure you catch us next time for another episode of What's On Your Mind.